take your Bibles this morning, and I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Psalms 139. That's going to give you a little searching opportunity. Psalms 139, and we're going to read verse 23 through verse 24. Psalms 139, verses 23 through verse 24. As you turn to that text, I want to ask you this morning, would you allow God to search your heart? Now when I say search your heart, I mean open up and say to God, if there's anything in me, in my mind, in my heart, in my attitude, in my actions, in my relationship with others, anything, God, that's in me as a Christian that shouldn't be there, would you show it to me, Lord, so I can confess it and get it out of my heart and out of my mind? You see, that's what David was asking God to do. If you would stand for, in reverence for our reading of the Scripture, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. May we pray. Father our God, we're so grateful this morning for the many blessings you've given us in this life. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought us to this place of worship once more. We know, dear God, that if we want to be negative, it's easy to be. All we've got to do is look at the COVID. All we've got to do is look around how things are shut down. And Lord, we could just moan and groan all day long. But that's not what Christians do. Christians should be the happiest people on earth, even in the midst of trouble. Because we have a Savior. And this world's not our home. We're passing through, and one day we'll stand with you in heaven. Lord, would you look at our hearts this morning? Would you convict our spirits that any wrong attitude, any hateful action, any word that we've said against someone, any thought that we've had to harm another human being, that, Lord, we, we just wish them not good, but hope that they'll get everything that's coming to them, Help us to understand that's not of God. That's of the devil. And if we be Christians, then we can't be filled with more Satan than we are with our Savior. So Lord, point it out to us this morning. And before we leave this place today, may we say to David that we can know that you know what's in our hearts so that we can cleanse it by confessing it to you. Now Lord, open every heart here. And we do pray, dear God, that you'll especially be with uh, our dear sister, Sandra DeMar, as she goes for her biopsy. We pray that as that's being taken, that you'll have a perfect peace, that you're going to meet every need that she has. And Lord, we pray for good news. We pray, Lord, that all will be well. But Lord, we trust you, and you know what's best. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. This is one of the most neglected scriptures in the Bible by Christians. The most neglected prayer that a Christian can pray. And you know why? Because we feel very uneasy that God would know what we have hid from the world and put deep back behind our heart so that no light of day will ever be shown on it. But let me remind you this morning, dear Christians, you are always being watched by the all-seeing eye of God. There's a hymn that used to be sung when I was a little boy, and it terrified the living life out of me because it's, it talked about the all-seeing eyes watching you. And as a child, I thought, I can't go nowhere. I can't do nothing because that eye is going to see me. Well, that should be the attitude of every child of God. I can do those righteous things, but I have no right to have any malice, 
any hatred, any anger in my heart for another human being. And you say, well, preacher, you're living in a world I don't live in. No, I've been there, done that. Probably got a t-shirt, but I can't find it. <laughs> you know, I, I know that we live in a world that some people just asking for it, aren't they? I used to have a lady, she'd come and tell me every Sunday morning, she said, preacher, I tried what you told me last week. I said, well, bless your heart. She said, but I didn't make it. I said, some people out there just asking for it. I said, I take it you give it to them too. And she never answered that. But what I want you to know this morning is that we as Christians are expected to be better than others. Why? Because my heart and your heart should be filled with Jesus and not with the things of this world and with the anger of life and with the hatred that goes on today. We live in a hateful world today. People literally hate you if you say the wrong word. I've been told so from, by a few people. You know what I say to them? I'll pray for you. I don't hate you. And I don't want you to hate me. You see... That's what this message is all about this morning. King David was in big trouble with God because he knew that God had witnessed him looking on another man's wife and lusting in his heart. And then to cover up the sin of adultery that he committed with that woman, he literally called her husband in who was a commander of the troops and told him, Next battle, I want you at the front. And then he told his confidants, make sure that he leads the charge. The man, of course, would be killed because the first three or four ranks on a charge usually die. David knew that. So he was not only an adulterer, but he was a murderer. Now you say, how can that be with the great King David? Because he was a man after God's own heart. And so are you. You're a woman, you're a man, after God's own heart. A child, after God's own heart. So how in the world can we do what we do? Let me ask you something. If I was to ask that we put a camera back there at the back door, and when you come in every Sunday morning, that we do an x-ray of your heart and soul, and we put it up on this screen that was down back there. For everybody in here to see what you've done this week. Every word that you'd said. Every deed that you had accomplished. Every evil thing that you had plotted. You'd never come back to church again, would you? <laughs> That's why I don't do it. <laughs> you know, I need you here. This is a house of getting right with God. This is not a place of perfection. Some people think I go to church because I'm a Christian and I'm better than other people. No, no. You go to church because you are being infilled with the Spirit of God so that you can be more like Jesus than you were before you came in that door as you go out. Now, if you wouldn't like that screen showing everything you've done, let me remind you this, that God is the silent listener to every conversation. He's the one that's looking over your shoulder as you pen poison pen notes. He's the one that knows your heart better than you know it. So if you're uncomfortable about that screen, Christian, you need to be very uncomfortable about the fact that God knows everything you've done, everything you will do, what you're plotting now and what you're about to say or think before you even know it. Why don't he stop me, preacher? Because the only thing that makes me and you different from any other animal on the face of the earth is we have a free will. Somebody told me one time, preacher, you know, now you need to realize that not all Baptists are free will Baptists. I said, you show me one don't, because it's not free will, and I'll show you one not a Baptist. It's not a denomination. It's an attitude. 
And I've had people tell me, well, preacher, I'm going to do what I want to do. You can preach about sin. You can preach about not being unkind to people. But I'm going to be me. And I always say to them, with all the strength I can muster, have a happy life being you. Because one day you're going to stand before a righteous God and he's going to show you what you've done and what you said. You may get to heaven, but you're going to also have to account for those things. Now, first thing I want, <clears throat> want to uh, do this morning is let us invite God to rummage through the dark places of our heart. Now, that, In order to do that, you've got to be honest. You've got to let God look. Here's something I want you to know. <clears throat> Many years ago, there was a family in the late 30s who had TB. Now back then, when a member of the family got TB, they were sent off, separated from the family, sent into a sanatorium for, for TB patients. Sometimes they'd be gone six months, sometimes they'd be gone a year. Nobody knew until they got better. And then the family would see the health department coming to their door and placing a sign on it which said quarantine. That meant that you couldn't go out and nobody else could come in. You say, we're beginning to understand that, aren't we? We've been quarantined for a while. But it wasn't like that. We, we can pretty much do it if we want to. But back then, when you were quarantined, you stayed there. Then after the person got well, and nobody in the family seemed to come down with it, maybe six months or so, they would let the family move out of the house. And I remember what my grandmother used to say. Anytime there was a germ in the house, she burnt sulfur candles. We don't even know what those are anymore. I'll tell you what, if you ever smell one, you won't want to do it again. <laughs> Foul. But the people would leave for a few weeks and they would just light these candles all over the house to kill the disease. And then when they thought it was gone, they'd come back in. Well, the family in Minnesota went through that process. And when they moved back in, nobody got sick. A whole year went by and the family was happier and healthier than they'd ever been. And then a little boy one day said to his sister that he wanted to go up in the attic, find some of his daddy's clothes to play dress up. Now for those that led a sheltered childhood, that's when children get their mom and daddy's clothes and play like their mom and daddy. So he went in the attic and he wasn't happy with just going to the first trunk he saw. He saw one way back in the corner behind a bunch of boxes. And it was filthy with dust, hadn't been open for many years. And he finally got it open, and he began to dig and dig and dig in that trunk till he got all the way to the bottom, and there he found his daddy's coat. That's what he wanted. He put it on. In a few days, he became gravely ill. The next two days, the little fellow passed away from being exposed to TB. You say, well, why do we need to know that, preacher? Because that's the way sin is. It lays and waits. It wants you to open your heart. It wants you to be acceptable to the thoughts that are evil. It wants you to find somebody you can't agree with. It wants you to try to hurt someone in the church. Or sometimes even the church itself. Say something bad. Do something toward someone. Nobody's going to find out because it's in that deep, dark corner of your heart. <clears throat> May I tell you that that's the thing that kills a person's relationship with Christ? I didn't say it took you salvation. If you're saved, you'll always be saved. I was born the son of my mother and dad. I could have went out and committed every crime under the sun, but... As shamed as they'd been of me, I'd have still been their son. I couldn't lose that status. If you're a son of God, you'll always be his son through Jesus Christ. 
but you can lose your joy. That's why we see people that sit on church pews look like they've been weaned on persimmon juice. <laughs> they just ugly face. I mean, everybody ought to stand where a preacher stands sometimes. You'd just be amazed what you can see from up here. That's why we got people to say, well, I don't think the church is doing what I need it to do. It ain't your church. And it ain't to satisfy you. Now I know that ain't, well that ain't in the dictionary now. I'm alright finally. <laughs> I've been using it for years. They finally caught up with it. I know that's not something you want to hear, but I hear people all the time say, well I'm just disappointed. I'm not getting what I need at the church. Well, maybe it's not what you need, it's maybe what you're missing because of something in your heart. Because when you fall out of relationship and joy with Jesus, everything you see, everything you hear, every person you run into, they just not doing what you think they ought to do. That's why we need to listen to what David said. David was so heavy burdened because of his sin and that God had found it out, even though he hid it, that he prayed for God just to forgive him. Just please, whatever it's there, Lord, show it to me so I can get it out. I can't live without you any longer. That's what David was saying. You see, we need to say, oh God, search me. Look at me, not my brother, not my sister. I used to sing a song that pretty well said it all. It said, tell it to Jesus. Most people are going to go tell everybody on you, but if you got something against me or against another brother or sister in Christ, you tell it to Jesus because then he's going to take care of that. You won't be mad and you won't be out of fellowship. Let me ask you, this past week, no show of hand, just that little one that God sees in your heart. If God has been watching you, which he has, has he seen envy in your life? Has he seen any hate? Has he caught you in any lies? Have you been cheating by telling God I'm one thing and you're really another? Did he see you gossip about somebody? I used to have a lady come to my office and she'd always say, now preacher, I'm going to tell you this about them, but don't you ever tell nobody. You know what I'd say? I'd get me a little book out and I'd write in it. I'd say, slow down, I'm, I'm taking this down. Well, what you going to do with it, preacher? I said, when I go tell that person that you're talking about what you said, I'm going to get the details about it. Needless to say, she didn't come back to my office. Now, I wouldn't have really done that, but I thought it was a pretty good effect. Because she never said that to me again. You know, don't tell it to me, tell it to Jesus. Has there been any malice in your heart? Anybody that hurt you years ago, I pastored a church down in Alabama. We needed an organ. Boy, they come on me like devils. I mean, preacher, I know you knew here. But we had a meeting back in, I believe it was in the 1800s. <laughs> and they said there would never be an organ in this church. I'd say, well, how many of them people that said that are still with you? No, no. I said, then why can't there be an organ? Because they said it. I said, well, why did they say it? I don't know. They just said it. I said, well, what was the problem with an organ? We don't know, but if they didn't want it in here, we're not going to have one. I said, okay. If that's the way you want it, I'll just turn it over to God, and we'll see what God says about it. We had an old piano that you could, it got tuned every week, I think. But you hit one key on it, it was out again. 
Mm -hmm. I used to sing up, down, in, between. Mm -hmm. You know, I hit every note up on the scale. <laughs> Mercy. So finally that old piano just wouldn't tune anymore. They said, we need to buy a piano. I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we buy a piano and an organ? Told you about the organ preacher. I said, do you want that new piano to go bad real quick too? You better think it over. So we put that organ in and I never heard another word out of anybody. That's just the most beautiful instrument I ever heard. It's added so much to the church. Why did I tell you that? Because they were holding on to evil thoughts for something they didn't even know about. Had no idea why. And it was holding the church back. Because everybody was talking about that bad, bad meeting in 1800. Which brings us to our second point. And let us invite God into our hearts, as King David did, to try me. Try me and know my anxieties. Now, some of us got anxieties, haven't we? We, we think anxiety is something that you're dreading. But it really reads more like this. In the New English, O oh God, let the secrets of my heart be uncovered, and let my wandering thoughts, that's the anxiety, my wandering thoughts be tested. <clears throat> let me ask you what you've been thinking about while I've been preaching. I said, well, preacher, we're listening to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You ain't had one wandering thought, have you? You ain't thought, I hope that man gets through pretty soon. Mm -hmm. You ain't had none of them thoughts. <laughs> oh, he's making me mad. He doesn't need to stay off of this. You know, usually when it's your sin, you always get aggravated by it. But let's that's, that's really do this now. Let's just let God uh, look at our wandering thoughts. You know that's where most of the meanings come from in our life. We imagine someone said something. Have you ever said, they're talking about me? Don't you think they got better things to do than talk about you? I had a lady one time tell me, now preacher, and I'm not just picking on you ladies, because I had some gossiping men in my time too. <laughs> I had a lady one time tell me, now preacher, Every time I walk in this church, I see people in that corner, in that corner, in that corner, and they're talking about me. I said, let's think about this for a minute. Did you tell them you were coming to church? No. Were they talking in those corners before you came in? Yeah, they'd already started talking about me. You get it? Nobody got time to talk about you if they're talking about Jesus. If you want your thoughts to wander, let them wander to the cross. And every time you do something, and this is not just a handy little saying, you ask yourself, would Jesus be pleased? What I'm thinking now, would Jesus be happy with that thought? What I'm about to do, would Jesus go with me to do it? Because, folks, the truth of the matter is everything you say, everything you think, everything you do, every action you take, Jesus is with you if you're a Christian. And you're making him a part of it. I used to have a man, he had a favorite scripture in the Bible, and he would always quote it to me because he, he loved alcohol. He said, well, Paul said take a little, little wine for the stomach. I said, well, there's several problems there. It wasn't alcoholic, first of all. And the other problem is, I had to pull you out of the ditch one night because you took a little wine for your stomach. <laughs> he fell into a ditch. You know what happened? I went, it was pouring down rain. I reached down to him. I said, brother, give me your hand. I'm going to help you up. I got him halfway up, and he said, just let me alone. Let me go. I did. <laughs> so when 
when he came to church the next Sunday, he said, Preacher, you almost drowned me. <laughs> I said, I didn't do that. He said, you threw me back in that ditch. I said, you don't remember saying, just let me go. I said, I did. Here's the funny thing about it. From that, that day on, that man never quoted that scripture again, and he never drank another drop of liquor. And you know what he said? He said, for the first time in my life, I was embarrassed about drinking. He said, I didn't think the preacher would catch me. I said, don't worry about me. You needed to worry about Jesus. And he said, I know that preacher. And that's why I want to be saved and I want to be baptized. And he was. So here's what I'm trying to say. Sometimes our thoughts wander to things we shouldn't be doing, shouldn't be saying, and shouldn't be thinking. Now, if God was looking into your heart today, which he is, because Jesus is living there, what would he see that would make you red-faced embarrassed? And it shouldn't be there, folks. Thirdly, can you say without the slightest hesitation, see if there is any wicked way in me? Is there anything wicked in you? What were we told by God? If your eye causes you to sin, you don't need that eye, do you? Look at Luke. Well, you don't have to turn. I'll read it to you. Luke 6, 42. How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in thy brother's eye. You see, our problem today as Christians is that we are speck extractors instead of plank removers. We like to see other people sin. Well, preacher, you just won't believe what they did. You won't believe what they said. You won't believe where I saw them. Well, you know, you got to be careful what you tell a preacher. <clears throat> Sometimes it betrays you. I had a gentleman tell me one time, well, preacher, I saw one of your deacons coming out of the liquor store. I said, what? I saw one of your deacons coming out of the liquor store. First of all, he's my brother in Christ. He's Christ's deacon. He's the one that ordained him. And secondly, what were you doing at the liquor store? <laughs> you ought to have seen the look on his face. If you ever seen blood drain out of anybody like a thermometer, it just turned white. He said, Preacher, I didn't think that through very well, did I? I said, I don't think so, my brother. I don't think so. Here's the point of all of that. We've got enough sin in our own hearts that we don't need sin, be looking at sin in other people's lives, do we? We've got enough to, for ourselves to confess. If we spent the rest of our life confessing our sins, we'd be too busy to find other people's faults. And I'm going to close with this. The words of David. He says, and lead me in the way of everlasting. In the way of everlasting. You know what that means? That means lead me to think in the way that people who inherit and inhabit heaven think. Let that mind be in me that is the mind of Christ. Somebody told me once, well, preacher, I can't control my mind. Yep. That's what I say when I overeat, too. <laughs> Somebody said, well, preacher, what do you do about it? Well, you see, overeating is not the problem. Mind control is not the problem for Christians. It's the problem is 
We don't want to control it. You've got to have a desire to control your thoughts before they can be controlled. You know, I think I can say this without any fear that some people live to be able to find something wrong with somebody else. I used to have a man to ask me, Preacher, what you preaching on today? And I'd always reply the same. Sin? What kind of sin? I say other people's. <laughs> <clears throat> Think about that for a minute. You know, it'll come to you. <clears throat> Isn't that the way that we are? We see the sin in their life but we don't see the sin in our life. We could be doing exactly the same thing, saying the same thing, going the same places, but we're going to talk about them and the way that they're allowing their self to act. Well, here's the whole message in a nutshell this morning. God's not interested in your brother or sister. He doesn't need you to tell him about them. He knows them like he knows you. God's interested in me. God looks into my heart and he says, forget those around you because I'm only going to ask you to account to me for what you do. You see, I'll never have to stand before God for your sins, but I will have to stand before a righteous God for my sins. And that's why my prayer is this morning, you'll make Psalms 19... Verse 14, your constant memory verse. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Because when it becomes personal, we're going to be so much better than we are right now. We're going to be happy because people that walk with Jesus are joyous people. People that always are trying to hide something from the eyes of the world. Oh, I just died if they knew what I did. They're very unhappy people. You see, you need to be open to God and then you won't have to fear what other people think or know about you. Because they'll say, that is one of the finest Christians I've ever known in my life. I had a young preacher tell me just the other day, Brother Ross, you're my hero. I'd say, well, don't, don't go that way now. He'd say, well, you are. I'd say, listen, I'm a man seeking to do God's will, but a man nonetheless. But he said, when I get in the ministry, he just began it, preaching, I want to be just like you. I said, then read the Bible, study the Bible, make it a part of your life, and preach the Bible regardless of what anyone in the world says. Preach God's Word. Folks, that's what it's about. Now, the reason I preach this Word this morning is because I want us, before we leave here today, to be honest with God. Search me, O oh God, and see if there is any wicked ways in me. Then we need to ask God, teach me the way of everlasting. Teach me to walk the path that Jesus walked, to talk the talk that Jesus talked, and to treat everyone the way that Jesus would treat them. You see, if we do that, this church will be full in no time. Because you know what happens? When we go out of this church in just a while, we're going to see that we're right back into the same old sinful world we were before we come in here. But if you're remarkably different, everywhere you go and every word you say and every deed you're about, people are going to wonder about you. And sooner or later, they're going to get around to asking you, what makes you different? And then you tell them about Jesus. Folks, that's what I want for you and for this church. 
I want us to be so full of Jesus that there's no room for hatred or envy or malice or, or backbiting, gossiping, and fussing with each other. Because you see, it's all about him. Not about us at all. Now, if you're a Christian, I want to ask you a question. Is there anything you need to confess to God this morning? And say, Lord, I really need your help to get rid of this. I really need you to come into my heart now, as you already are. But I want you to be so real that you help me never to do this again. That's all you got to do. Confess your sin. Because we all sin. You may be a sinner lost and undone, headed for hell without Jesus. But even those of us that are sinners saved and sealed for eternity are sinners nonetheless. Just sinners saved by grace. So if there's something you need to tell God, tell him. You don't have to come down to me. You can if you like, if you feel comfortable. But you can do it right where you're at. Mm -hmm. My desire for this church is to be the greatest witness in this community. For everybody that sees us will see Jesus, and we'll be a light shining so brightly that nobody can help but come and see what's going on. That's the way I've always seen churches filled, folks. It's when we get full of Jesus that people start coming. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw them to me. So we need to lift him up. If you're, if you're not a Christian and Jesus has spoken to your heart about salvation, please pray the simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me a sinner. Come into my heart. Take control of my life and be my Lord and Savior. Save me, Lord, and he will. And then we'll talk about baptism and all the other. Maybe some of us need to come and pray for me for people that we need to forgive. And we want to forgive us. Maybe we need to rededicate our life, standing right where you're at. There's a decision to be made by every one of us this morning. Would you stand? <clears throat> Father our God, we're so grateful today that you've given us this scripture. That Lord, our heart has been open to the knowledge that we need to be just like you. And that, Lord, we don't need to have anger and hatred and malice in our heart. But we need to be filled with so much love and forgiveness that people will just see that we're remarkably different. Now, Lord, you know every decision that's been made in this room. And I pray, Lord, whether they stand in the pew or come down front and kneel or share it with me, whatever you've let them do, that, Lord, this will be a day of change and rejoicing in each heart. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. change a thing. You just come to Jesus, confess it, say, Lord Jesus, change me. From the soles of my feet to the crown of my head, from the inside out and the outside in, make me like you, Lord. And when you do that, it will all be different. And life will be so joyous. Would you come? This is your verse.